there. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Jessica Williamson, Livestock and Forage Manager with Agco. And I'm Matt LaCroix, Director of Marketing for Massey Ferguson and hosted by Massey Ferguson Hay Equipment. And we're going more in-depth uh, on our machine settings. If you listened to our last episode, we covered mowers and tedders. In this episode, we're going to cover rakes and balers. And we've got a lot to cover here since you've got small squares, round balers, large squares, and all that kind of great stuff. So stay tuned, and we will get into a deeper dive on manufacturer settings and recommendations for your equipment. So today we're talking about rotary rakes and wheel rakes and proper machine settings and how fast you need to go, how you need to set your flotation, and all that kind of good stuff here at Massey Ferguson and Hesse by Massey Ferguson. We offer multiple options on rotary rakes and wheel rakes. Um, we have high capacity V rakes. We go all, all the way down to an eight wheel V rake. Um, a good thing also when we're looking at making sure you get that middle part of the crop off the ground and get it kicked over, we have center kicker wheels, which I recommend for almost all applications. When you're really going after that high quality, um, we're always suggesting the rotary rakes. Now, when you first look at a rotary rake, um, there's a little bit higher cost associated with it, but uh, it'll pay dividends in the future if you're looking for higher quality because uh, you're going to have a better quality hay, you're going to have less ash content and so forth. And, and you know, if you are doing alfalfa, for sure, you're going to be protecting those very vital and important leaves. So, Jess, why don't you get us started on rotary rakes? And I think you did a study uh, on rotary rakes or, or studies. And tell us what you found with ground speed and, you know, uh, raking height and how a rotary rake may or may not compare to a wheel rake. Mm -hmm, sure. So I guess I'll back up just a little bit and talk about a project that was done um, several years ago uh, with Dr. Dan Undersander and colleagues. Um, and they actually looked at a comparison between different rakes, the rotary rake being one, rotary rake, wheel rake, sidebar rake, and a merger. And they wanted to look at overall leaf retention as well as ash content. And they found that any of our ground-driven rakes, so um, a wheel rake or a sidebar rake in this particular uh, study, had more leaf loss and also had greater ash content. So um, essentially what ash content is, is uh, mineral particles, inorganic particles that are introduced into your hay. And it's a negative thing because with every 1% increase in ash content, we get a 1% inverse decrease with the available energy in the crop. So uh, also it's important to know that we're never going to get a 0% ash content because ash is innately found within our crops. We see about a 6% in our grasses and 8% in our alfalfa. So anything above those levels are going to be uh, introduced into the crop. So what that project looked at was uh, essentially just different rake types. And as I said, um, a reduction in ash content in the rotary rake and in the merger. So anything that is essentially power driven. And this uh, past summer, we actually wanted to look at that also um, uh, in the ashiest soils that we could find in the United States. So we went up to Pasco, Washington, where their soils are literally volcanic ash. And we wanted to test our rotary rake against a wheel rake and a basket rake. So this past year, whenever we looked at those different uh, those different types of rakes, we looked at a, a double rotary center delivery uh, Massey Ferguson 802 um, rotary rake. We looked at a parallel bar rake or a basket rake compared to a wheel rake. And what we wanted to look at were all three of those different rakes at different ground speeds. Um, and we wanted to take a look at the ash content or um, uh, how good of quality that those rakes uh, created in those crops. And essentially what we found at five, seven, and nine mile an hour 
running across the field was the rotary rake had a lower ash content than our other two comparison rakes at all three of those different ground speeds. So, um, you know, in our uh, uh, Western commercial hay operations, rotary rakes are not excessively popular. Um, and I think that this is a really good study showing that, um, you know, by incorporating these rotary rakes into these operations, we're going to get overall higher forage quality at regardless of what speed you're running across the field. And uh, we're going to get overall less ash content and higher leaf retention in our alfalfa crops. And for those of you that are in grass hay areas, whether it be in the southeast, northeast, or wherever it is, and you hear us talking about leaf retention, don't think we're always 100% talking about alfalfa uh, because there are obviously leaves on your grass haze, uh, blades, uh, blades you may call them sometimes. And if you do your processes, whether it be raking or tedding, process incorrectly, you're going to lose some of that higher value uh, material that you want to help retain. So keep in mind that always when we say leaf retention, it's not always about alfalfa. So that's a, that's a very good point. So what I like to do, Jessica, um, when I go out to rake a field with a rotary rake, and it is one of my favorite pieces of equipment to use, honestly, um, it's almost like you're painting in the field when you're putting the pre lines out there and making a, a good, uh, good windrow for the baler to come through because honestly raking is one of the most important processes of making an efficient uh, hay field is I like starting out as low as possible with my RPMs. So I'll even start out sometimes down to 380 RPMs. So just so you know, on the, uh, the Massey Ferguson side of the rotary rakes, we never suggest they be run at 540 RPMs. So I think uh, 480 is about the maximum we, we usually run, but sometimes I'll start out at 380 just to make sure I am, making that windrow as fluffy and straight as possible and has the perfect width on it. Because sometimes if you have your RPMs too high, regardless of where you've got your apron set that actually determines how wide your windrow is going to be, they can sling some of that crop in front of it, underneath it, that type of thing. So you got to keep that in mind, especially when you get an alfalfa or something like that. Um, also, you can you know rake ear earlier and stuff with a rotary rake. Uh, I've got a pretty good little video if you go on YouTube and look at it showing the difference in windrow formation between a rotary rake and a uh, wheel rake. The rotary rake is going to stay fluff here. It's going to continue the dry down process, obviously, uh, and you can actually rake earlier. Normally with the V rake or wheel rake, you're going to come in usually right in front of the baler, uh, right, make that uh, windrow. Whereas with the rotary rake, you can come in ahead of time and continue that process and potentially bail earlier. And of course, we all know the faster you get the crop off the field, the higher your quality is and the better uh, it's going to look. So when yeah. you go into the field, um, and I say I start out at 380. One thing you have to keep in mind is make sure you've got plenty of horsepower on your tractor. So if you're running a, say, 60, 70 horsepower tractor and you have a 25-foot rotary rake, it's going to take a little bit of horsepower because rotary rakes have a little weight to them as well. But if you're trying to run it at 380 PTO, the RPM on your engine is not going to be high enough, so you'll end up stalling your tractor. So that's another thing you got to make sure that you work, you know, within what uh, what capacity you have with your tractor to be able to maintain a certain RPM and and ground speed. So of course, if you're trying to get 400 RPMs on your implement, you're trying to have your ground speed at seven, and you've got a 50 horsepower tractor, you're probably not going to make that work for you that day right mm -hmm. so make sure you look at all of those different uh, scenarios before you before you hit the field yeah i want to touch on one thing that you said there you talked about raking earlier and um for our listeners i just want to give the the agronomic reasoning behind why raking earlier is better um, so essentially, uh, and, and this is all just like with every process of making hay, you need to pay attention to the weather, um, and pay attention to what your drying conditions are. But if you have a wonderful, uh, a sunny, low humidity, excellent drying day, you want to rake that crop as early as possible, because we know that it can continue to dry down whenever it's in that wind row, um, prior to baling. And so the sooner that you can rake that crop, or the higher the moisture that that crop is raked at. And just like you said, this goes for grasses and legumes or an alfalfa crop. 
um, the better the overall leaf retention we're going to have and the higher the quality of that crop is going to be. And just like Matt said, um, those big fluffy windrows that we get with that rotary rake, they are really, really ideal for uh, drying down our crop um, and drying it down uniformly. So you talked about your video with the differences in the type of windrow. That's something that we saw uh, that was really, really apparent in this project as well was the roping um, of the parallel bar rake or from the wind or I'm sorry, from the wheel rake. Um, and if you see the roping and almost the tying together of that crop in the windrow versus those big, fluffy, huge um, windrows from the rotary rake, you can, it's, it's just visually apparent that that crop is going to dry down at a slower rate um, versus what's going to happen within the windrow of the rotary rake. And for those of you who may not know what we're, what we're referring to on the roping, and you show, saw Jessica doing the twisting there, think of taking a, yep. a bath towel that's wet and you wring it out and twist it, twist it, twist it. That's what ends up happening. And that leads in perfectly to what we're about mm -hmm. to discuss on baling processes. So when you have a, a wheel rake and you have heavy crop and it does that roping, what's going to happen is that baler, when the pickup hits that crop, is when we start grabbing that crop and depending on your ground speed and how heavy the crop is, it'll start pulling the crop from under the tractor or even up. I've seen it pull up as past the tractor uh, because the crop was really heavy and there was a little bit of moisture in it and it was grabbing that rope of hay and from in front of the tractor and pulling it because we're building at slower speeds because A, it was wet and uh, we're just trying to make the heaviest bell possible. We're doing some different studies and that kind of thing. But when you run into a rotary rake, we're talking about that fluffiness and what that equates to not only dry down, but on your bailing process, it makes your bailing process more efficient because uh, you can bail on average uh, anywhere from half a mile an hour faster to one and a half miles an hour faster, depending on your bailer on behind a rotary rake wind rope. So when you want to look at uh, the price of fuel these days, you'll be able to get a lot more efficiency out of your tractor and your baler uh, by doing that. So we're going to hop into balers now. Uh, I'll talk about all of them briefly to start off with. So you got small square balers. Uh, we have multiple different sizes in small squares. And of course, all of our small square balers here at Hesma Massey Ferguson are going to be inline design. So we actually modeled them after our large square baler. We invented large square baler back in you know 1978. And then we designed our small square to mimic that. So it drives uh, obviously right behind the tractor. So you're straddling the windrow just like you would with a round bale. And it works great for whether you're going down the road, uh, if you're on the side of a hill, you don't have as much drifting. And also if you're running any kind of accumulator behind it, that pull type accumulator or a self-propelled accumulator behind it, those bales are gonna be super consistent every time since the material goes from point A to point B in a straight line process and there's no 90 degree turns. And of course, lots of times you can run less horsepower because of that design. So with small square, Jessica, um, when we're looking at manufacturer suggestions and that kind of thing, uh, one of the things we need to think about also is obviously bell weight because uh, you may be selling into an equine market or uh, maybe exporting it or anything. So you have any suggestions of uh, what we should think um, about with small I squares? Think that, uh, it's, it's very much going to depend on your market and what you are doing with your bales. So uh, I know a lot of dairy farms that might do small squares so that they can throw them into their TMR mixer. Those bales are usually quite big. Um, I mean, we're talking about, you know, 130 pound bales that it takes a, a full grown man to throw. But if you're uh, focused on an, an equine market, um, where, you know, you're going to have a lot of handling of your hay manually. Um, typically we're going to recommend a smaller bale, um, so that, you know, uh, people of, of all ages and sizes are able to handle those bales with a lot more ease. I, I just think that it really comes down to what you're doing with your hay. So now we're going to look at, at large squares. And one thing I do want to remind everybody when you're looking at whether it be a small square or a large square, your ground speed, your RPM speed uh, can really factor into your quality of your overall end product, right? So we are talking about the equine market a minute ago on the small squares. So one thing people want to do is they want to have a certain size foot. 
right? So usually a small square bale that's going into the retail market, you want to have about 12 flakes in that bale. And that's going to get you around that 50 to 60 pound bale. And how you control the size of those flakes is your ground speed. So one, one factor is your ground speed, also your wind row size. You can control that. So if you're trying to um, move really fast through the field, you're not going to get those 12 flakes that are going to be three inches. You're going to end up with eight flakes. Uh, so that's going to obviously change the density of the bale. And also it's going to change the end product, how well it's going to hold up and transport and all that kind of good stuff. Another thing you can do with that, uh, which we don't usually suggest, is change RPM speeds. Uh, if you start running RPMs uh, too low or lower than manufacturer's recommendations, you run the risk of uh, damaging the, the machinery just like almost as bad as if you're over revving it. And I will tell you this, almost no small square on the market is going to be handling RPMs above 540. So I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't suggest that. Uh, but it will affect your end crop. So staying within those manufacturer's recommendations is always super important right there. And, and then you jump over to the large squares, the very similar scenario. Uh, we have uh, on our large squares, we have uh, three different sizes. We've got a three foot by three foot size, three foot by four foot. We've got two different models there, a regular uh, baler, and also we have the extra density baler. And then you jump up into a four by four. Uh, and when you make a four foot by four foot by eight foot bale in a normal 14% moisture crop, you're looking at a one ton bale right there. Uh, multiple things to think about there, but the way ours is designed with the pre-compression chamber, and the reason we have that, so every flake that comes up into that chamber is 100% consistent. So until that flake fully is formed within a pre-compression chamber, the material is not going to move from point A to point B. So it's not timed, it's not shooting up through there. So it actually protects the operator and it makes you end up with a better you know overall package at the end because of that but one thing you want to make sure you maintain is one uh plunger stroke and then one stuffer stroke uh you know one to one ratio and how you do that is uh by either driving faster in the field if that's possible you always want to stay safe of course or making sure your wind row is big enough when it's coming into the baler so one thing we see lots of times uh, is more, I would say, a problem in the past than it is today. One thing we saw in the past is if you had a windrow that was too small, maybe it was that third cutting that you maybe or maybe shouldn't have done, but you were really uh, anxious to get that crop, and you had to drive half a mile to get one bale, uh, what would happen would be that baler was overworking that, that stuffer, and it wasn't actually shooting the crop up in there, right, into the chamber. So you would end up with uh, a less than perfect bill at the end. So, you know, it's, you know, bad in, bad out. So you need to make sure your window is very consistent. You stay consistent with the RPMs. Uh, all large square balers are going to be running at 1,000 RPMs. So that's one thing you need to, to make sure you uh, keep in mind when you're running those balers. So talk to us a little bit about that windrow size and what, what an ideal perfect windrow looks like whenever we're going into a square baler. Are we looking at 100% exactly of the pickup width? Um, do we want that just slightly less than the pickup width or just slightly more than the pickup width so that we can make sure that we're getting um, uniform pickup for that bale? That's a very good, very good question. So one thing we have is... Uh driving lights in our large square. So it's almost unheard mm -hmm. of in large square balers to have driving lights, but ours have driving lights to make sure you're filling up that chamber from both sides. Yeah. So if if your farming practice that you currently have makes your windrow where it's only three feet wide, you will have to do swerving back and forth with your large square, just like you would with a round bale, to make sure you have a good square shouldered bale. Uh, but if you're, you know, have the ability to make a perfect, you know, width on a, uh, a windrow, you'd want to make that thing, you know, right at whatever your chamber size is. So granted, our pickup is much wider than that, and that allows for some, you know, error or going around curves and corners and turn the headlands and that kind of thing. But if you can make it the exact same size and have a nice flat square uh, windrow going into it, and it's the same size as your chamber, you're going to have the best product at the end of the day. So if you're running a three foot wide baler, have a three foot wide windrow. If it's a little bit wider, it's not going to hurt. I'd go a little bit wider more so than going narrower. But on the four foot balers, you'd want to run a, a four foot or larger windrow. Now, uh, one thing to keep in mind is, like I said, make sure you go a little bit wider, the air on the wider versus the narrower. Mm -hmm. So moving right into round balers, um, 
I remember a research study that I saw a while ago looking at uh, bale formation and windrow width. And while this is at the top of my mind, I wanted to go ahead and mention it. Um, if we're looking at windrows that are significantly narrower than the chamber width, the best way to bale those is to go up one side favor one side of the baler for a certain length of time, whether that be for um, an eighth of your windrow length or a quarter of your windrow length, and then weave back to the other side. Um, it's kind of a common misconception that we want to weave back and forth. But if we take a look at how that bale is forming in that round chamber, by allowing it to form a little bit on one side and then moving a little bit to the other side, that actually is going to give us the best chance at the most even and not lopsided bale by going quite a ways up the windrow on one side of that chamber and then switching to the other side of the chamber uh, for that bale formation. I know a lot of times if we're, you know, so I'm in the mid Atlantic region and sometimes our second and third cutting. Uh, crops can be a little on the uh, lower yielding side. So we might be looking at a really narrow windrow. So if we're baling round bales, that's a really good tactic rather than weaving back and forth and trying to get an even bale formation at that point. Yeah. And you look at operator fatigue, right? At the end, end of yeah, the day. Oh, yeah. So all the moving back mm -hmm. and forth. But, uh, one thing I do want to caution about is make sure you try it out first and make sure um, – you don't go too far and then go a little bit further each time to get to that point. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason being is because the tensioning rack sometimes in a baler, if you go too far past what Jessica just said and you're not paying attention, those tensioning racks will get sideways. You could flip some belts and stuff. So make sure you uh, keep that in mind when you do that. But, you know, going back to manufacturers recommendations and settings, uh, you can get round balers. They come in 540 and 1,000. Uh, here it has to be Massey Ferguson and Massey Ferguson. We offer balers from uh, 4 by 5 size all the way up to 5 by 6 We've got the silage cutter balers. We've got dry hay balers, all with variable chambers. So you can make a smaller bale if you need to. So if you have a 4 by 5 baler and you need a 4 by 4 bale, it's easy to do. So uh, you can just change it from monitor and make it size, and it'll beep at you when it's uh, – got that that bell size but when you get into those difficult crops so let's just take a really slick grassy hay that's uh, probably that third or fourth cutting that you probably shouldn't have done uh, but you need, needed the hay so you did it mm -hmm. and it's very slick and dry or you've got a, a rotary straw for instance mm -hmm. and sometimes that crop is hard to feed and get started into a, a bale because it is uh, actually fighting against you when you're doing it so one thing I suggest for people when they do that type of thing is maybe speeding up your ground speed a little bit when you start that bale and potentially slowing down your RPMs a little bit. Now, I know we want you to run at 540 or you want you to run at 1,000 depending on your baler, but if you slow that 540 down to a 480, it will allow that crop to start that you know formation of a, a round bale a little bit easier on those type of crops. Now, of course, if you're in two-foot-long Bermuda, it's not a problem. <laughs> if you're... If you've got nice, yep. you know, 21 to, to 22 inch or whatever it is, half alpha, it's not going to be a problem. But I'm saying there's really difficult crops. That's a, that's a good rule of thumb. Yeah. And, and another thing by, by reducing that RPM speed just ever so slightly, as Matt suggested, um, you know, if you look behind you and you're seeing all of that dust coming out of the pickup at the baler, that is loss of crop quality and that's loss in dry matter yield. So you're going to see a reduction in that dust coming out of the pickup. Um, and so you can ensure that you are optimizing your yield and optimizing your forage quality at that point. Um, you know, it's, it's painful to, for me to, to, to see a baler running and to see all that dust coming out of it because that's our nutrients coming out of it. And so by reducing that RPM speed just ever so slightly, we can help to preserve some of that quality. Yeah, very good point. And uh, the last thing I'm going to touch on with the manufacturer settings is when you look at operator's manuals for round balers, you can see uh, a myriad of different you know miles per hour ranges that you can run in. So you can run anywhere from two miles an hour to 10 miles an hour easily with a round bale. Um, one thing is just because a round bale can do, round baler can run at that speed doesn't mean you should. So you need to think of what you want your end product to be 
as it relates to your ground speed. So if you're going to have your RPMs running at manufacturer's rated, whether it be 540 or 1,000, and you're going to run at two or three miles an hour, you're going to really pack that material in there. You're going to have a really dense bale, and your end product is going to be a really heavy bale. So if that's what you want to do, and you want to uh, and, you know, capture as much prop material as you can in that bale, because you're going to feed it yourself, you're not going to transport it, you're not going to sell it by the bale, uh, or you're going to sell it by the ton, uh, that's the best, most efficient package you can do is make that bell as heavy as possible, as dense as possible. And that way also you're saving on twine and or mesh regardless of which one you're using. Mm-hmm. Now, if for some reason you're doing ring feeding, for instance, you want that core of that bell maybe to be a little bit softer. Our balers have an optional soft uh, core kit, and you can turn that on from the monitor. And what that does, you can choose how big that core is up to 33 inches. And therefore, when those cows come in there and they're grabbing that crop uh, and pulling it with their teeth, they can pull it out easier. Because if you have a really hardcore variable chamber chamber, um, baler, it's going to get really tight in there. And they're going to have trouble eating that out of a ring feeding, right? A lot of people do the the rolling style and they push the bell down the the field and it unrolls itself. Mm -hmm. But that's that's another way of feeding it. But that's another thing. If you're driving that 10 mile an hour, uh, even if you have a decent windrow, your bell at the end of the day is going to be lighter weight. It's not going to have as much density. Uh, it's not going to hold together as well. So if you're looking at stacking multiple layers of bells on top of each other, you're going to end up squatting a lot of those bales by the end of the end of the season or by the time you get around to feeding them. And if you're selling them, of course, or doing custom bailing for somebody, you want the overall visual appeal to be there. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Another thing, if you're making hay to feed to your own livestock and you're talking about the different types of cores, uh, it's also important to think about your bale handling ability, right? Uh, Maybe the size of your skid loader that you're going to be moving those bales with. If you're using a bale spear versus a grapple or maybe uh, forks, because if you're using a grapple or forks, it really doesn't matter how tight that core is because you're going to be, uh, you know, moving that bale from the external. But if you're using a bale spear, you know, some of our balers uh, that are some of our bales that our balers make, you try to spear it and it just pushes it right across the field, right? I mean, because it's such a tight core, you can't even get a bale spear into it. So that's another thing to think about as well is matching how you're bailing your bales with your round baler to however it is that you're handling them. So that's something that I see on a firsthand basis, uh, you know, with our cows. Yeah. Thank you, Jessica, for uh, joining us today. And thank you all that's out there listening for joining us on another episode of Massey Ferguson Hay Talk. This has been Rotary Rake and Baylor Manufacturers Recommendations and Settings. So join us next time on Massey Ferguson Hay Talk. We look forward to seeing you very soon. 